build culture before you enter growth stage. When you have the right culture within your company, that is flourish. When you go to growth stage, you have more people. More people with more problems, more friction, internal conflict due to this, due to that. Basic admin stuff, costing time. HR people having more people in and out and awkwardly time not consumed well. So build culture before you enter the growth stage so that you can be my the risk people that enter it with your you know, expected culture. Hi folks, welcome back to On Call with Insignia, where we go on call with leaders innovating the future of Southeast Asia's internet and digital economy, or as we like to call it, ASEAN Innovation. I'm your host, Paolo Aquino, and we have a return guest in our call today, none other than the founder and CEO of Pinhei, uh, Hu Yingyem, who is coming back on the show after a year. We continue our conversation from the previous episode, which covered more of Finhei's growth as a business with the backdrop of Vietnam's resilient and fast-growing economy amidst global market uncertainties and headwinds. From here on, Hui shares more about his leadership approach in developing Finhei as an organization that is building for an AI future, developing Vietnam's engineering talent pool, and operating as a maturing company. Let's dive right into the call. And now I wanted to get into the topic we touched on earlier, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners would be interested to hear about is uh, you talked about how Gen AI, GPT, you're, you're slowly integrating that into the different products that you have. Maybe you can speak a little bit more about some examples and maybe within your own organization at Pen, hey, how you know AI has been helping your organization okay. improve efficiencies and all that. Yeah, yeah. So we've been applying AIs since the day that they talk about. So I think even before chat GPT and so on, but that time 2018 was very early for us and the use case was very limited however in the last four months we've been applying quite heavily ai you know sort of business operation first of all it's operation yeah. itself so our operation means that you know, like development and everything covering everything so our big team started using copilot from github so now they code even faster the Instead of they had to write the whole sort of line of codes and then jumping to the next line and so on. So this co-pilot helps a lot. And the team been using it and it improved the productivity of the team. And this is the same now. The output, the production been improved as well. In our sprint, we generally release one update per sprint, which is two weeks. Now we can do it within a week. Every week we have a new update, constantly, constantly. So being applying AI in the coding, helping a lot. We have a dedicated team just work on using a GPT-4 as a tool. And also we start inputting our data into that tool, allowing internal team members to start testing, testing and asking relevant financial data so that when we are confident with this use case, we can launch it out to users. So when they chat on a platform, they can ask about, let's say, certain stock and move it down a certain level of uh, data to them. So instead of them have to look, search for information on the web. So that is within the app itself. And even customer support. Customer support. We have seen so far a lot of clients been asking the same question all the time. The solution before was a simple decision tree. You click on this option, it goes to this option and that option. However, client knows that what, and we want now to improve that feeling that when they chat with us, it's not just a bot, but it's feel more human. So obviously, GPT-4 been solving that problem, or GPT-3.5, and that helps our organization. There are more use cases that we okay. testing out. We actually hosting hackathon internally oh. in the coming weeks. So what it does is uh, the topic was very simple: applying AI in all facets of FinTech. Yeah. So we will have six teams to work on this, and they will be the one that coins the idea and create a solution and solve problem, and then launch it to the market and see how it goes. Yeah, no, I think it's really exciting to see what comes out of all these like experimentation and iterations that you guys are doing with the GPT internally. And as you mentioned, if they do work out well, then you might even port them over to the user side 
And yeah. you can actually see that in action on the Finhay platform. So excited for that. And speaking of developers and engineers, I'm sure this is an exciting time for them, especially those working at Finhay. But I think Vietnam has always had this reputation of being a great talent pool for engineering talent. I wanted to ask how you're seeing the talent pool evolve in Vietnam since you first returned in 2017 and started Finhay. Like, how has the tech talent pool and all that evolved? Yeah, you know, I have seen the, the tech talent being more, I would say, they are more coming to market and the quality, quality even become way better. I think, I think it, yeah, thanks, big thanks to a big player. They, they has always been a, a leader in the tech sector in Vietnam. And also thanks to the many unis in Vietnam being talked about transformation, tech transformation, which inspired many students that looking into software engineer and engineer in general. And Bekhoa Un University has always been a uni that creating many great talents over there. And also the ecosystem itself, the business like Finhay in the market and many other tech players in the market that me that creating more demand for software engineers so that tailor or even refine their skill. So my observation is that I do see a lot more people accepting this role as a need and many business and bring them. So yes, the demand is there, the supply is there, and the quality is also there. I'll give you a bit of a, a small talk. In 2017, I talked to a couple of people like older generation when we talk about a designer, a software engineer, and they would say, what is this? Been? And now they understand, okay, you should be in software engineer, create products. They'll say, okay, that changed. So what is it? That influence or the idea of being in software engineer, make the older people think this is our proper jobs and you should be in. I think that's a good sign. So that's what we have seen so far. I'll get to Vietnam. I do see a software talent is very needed. And also, fortunately, we do see a lot of them in the market. And it would be great to also see like Finhay become like, if maybe you are already like a dream company for these, for these engineers, <laughs> go work in, go work in Finhay if you want to become a software engineer. And. Yeah, I also wanted to shift gears and talk about your own leadership approach and how you had to evolve yourself as a leader. Uh, now you're very much in a growth growth stages and still growing, of course. So anything like from the early days of Finhay, any sort of mindset or practice that you've had to let go of or unlearn as a leader as you as Finhay has grown? Um, as a company that we have 160 people within the company, and there are many functional team, cross-functional team departments and school of business, it requires not just myself, but also the next level leaders need to improve their skill, not just a technical, but also leadership soft skill, communication skill, teamwork, model, fundamental model to cross functional team, and also more high level knowledge being shared from a bigger companies. For example, uh, we attain a training hosted by one of our shareholders, so they invite consultant from America and all around the world come to Vietnam and we're using the Harvard way, identify or analyze cases and see whether it can apply in our company and how do we improve it. And one of the knowledge that we had gathered from that training was being authentic leadership you want to create a culture of the company. Second of all, if you want to execute well, you need information. Information means all the team are on the same page. They are talking about the same thing. And when they do the work, they are achieving the same objective. And if you look at our real life practice, not just Vita, but also many others, one of the things that we have seen in the last few years, we had many meetings. Mm -hmm. So many meetings mean 
just a way that people communicate to tra- transfer information. Right. And we have this meeting with this group, but then you have another people that are not on the same page. You create another meeting, keep going on. The time wasted. So I think it's very like the idea of how do we transfer information effectively amongst team members. Anyways, so that's the training part I would want to go into detail mm-hmm. with. But at least, you know, all of those skills, when we relive it, how do we apply it in our company so that we improve our work efficiency and productivity output? Uh, yes, leadership change when the company grows. Same as myself. I do see myself, so I do see myself being, I will say, changed a lot in the last few years, given that the sales company also grow and also see many members within the company great as well because of the company being growing up and down and the skill has been strengthened. I think it's, it's a really interesting concept, really shifting I'm focusing on the product efficiency to organizational efficiency. And on that note, I wanted to move into our next corner, which is the Minute Masterclass. If you were to give a masterclass on building fintech company in Vietnam to entrepreneurs and business leaders from across the world, what would be the key takeaway that you would want them to have after that class? So let's say, let's say early stage. Let's say early okay. stage. Okay. Okay. Early stage. My sort of advice for the early stage from that master class is forming the optimal team formation. Given that fintech companies are running fintech company and you need a right, right formation team, you would need three types right. of team members but for early stage. And that thing can involve foundation of the company. So first type is engineers. Obviously, engineers have to cover the front end, back end, full stack better. Um, second of all, you need designer, UX designer, UI designer, graphic designer. Generally, in early stage, one person can cover all, all better. And third type of person you would need is the hustler. Basically, the one that can sell the product to the market, digitally, offline, whatever. So that three types of people are very important for the first team formation. And from that, I can evolve. And I learned not just from advice I get from one of the investors that we had in 2017, 2018, but also from the book, Inspired, and many other books I've seen. So basically, the team. The optimal deep formation you should have for productivity is three types of people, engineer, designer, and also a hustler. So yes, that's my sort of very short advice for early stage team to yeah. form a team. I'm actually curious, since you mentioned there's early stage and there's, I'm wondering if you have an answer prepared for growth stage. <laughs> yeah, the, for growth stage, build culture before you enter growth stage. When you have the right culture within your company, that just flourish. When you go to growth stage, you have more people. More people need more problems, more friction, internal conflicts due to this, due to that. Basic admin stuff, costing time. HR people having more people in and then out and off the time and not consumed well. So, Build culture before you enter the growth stage so that you can minimize the risk people that enter it with your, you know, expected culture. And, and like specific to Vietnam, like anything that our audience, maybe the lead business leaders out there should know about like building a company culture in Vietnam in particular? Good question. For sure, a lot of leaders in Vietnam be looking to culture and building it and improving it day by day. For sure. And for my advice for others, because you're yet to be in growth stage, better to build it now. Because the smaller you build it, the better in the future. You think of this, you are a group of, let's say, four people. It's easier to start forming your culture than you have 100 people and you start looking into the culture. Very hard. But obviously, culture is built from your consistent activities, and your, how you present as a leader, how you present in company, and that influences the culture. 
But yes, yeah, so my sort of immediate advice is do it before you enter Rome stage. Right. Or may not, may, maybe not do it, but at least you start seriously thinking about it before you enter this. And on that note, I wanted to go into our final corner for this call, which is a rapid fire round. I prepared a new set of questions for Hui since he's done this twice before already. So the first question is, if you were invited to develop your own Netflix series or OTT series, what will be the title of the show? Oh, wow. I never thought about being a... <laughs> you know, <laughs> <not all> celebrity. <laughs> I never thought about it before. Oh, wow. That's actually very... I like the term, nothing is impossible, but that is, mm. but also I like the, the idea of just do it. And I like the, the idea of being different. Okay. I think being different could be, be the title. If there's something that you could automate in your job just by wishing for it, what aspect of your role would that be? Writing that email and answering repetitive questions. I thought you were going to say compliance and the, all the, all the admin back office. <laughs> If you would pick anyone alive or dead to be your 24-7 executive coach, who would it be? Executive coach? Yeah, if you had an on-call executive coach uh, and you could pick anyone, like alive or dead. Ray Dalio. <laughs> Ray Dalio. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I read his principal books and also try to reflect myself using that book as well. And also now I'm trying to digest the changing the world order. So I think from his sharing, it made a lot of sense. And I really his style as well, yeah. Next question. If there were no issue about budget, like where would you want to bring your team to for a company offsite? Good question. I would say Japan. Yeah. I, uh, I think I would say Japan is a country that you will see perfect vision. So I, I would like to bring the team there. Out of that, looking at Sakura, enjoying the good weather, but also look at how Tokyo so efficient, how the entire train system be so effective and efficient. So, because if you look at it and try to apply here, it's in the organization. How do we, from the ideation stage into having a live production product running, it should be less of time and quality. Anyway, so maybe that's the idea of why uh, mm. I was called compare them. Yeah, no, I think it's a, that's a great perspective. And I think that really ties in a lot of what you talked about earlier about building efficiency as yeah. the company becomes more complex. And finally, yeah. to wrap up this, this corner, anything that you've read, I mean, you mentioned you're reading, re reading Ray Dalio's books, but anything else that you're reading, anything new that you're reading or taking up recently? Yeah, I'm actually reading the Changing the World Order. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, are we going through a big cycle? I don't know. Yeah, shifting from America to China or anything. We're not talking about politics. We're talking about uh, economy and also mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the business generally. So I think the book tells a lot. Yeah. And on that note, I would like to thank Hui again for coming on the show. Uh, give us an update on Pinhei. But I think what's new th in this particular episode is that he's also shared his thoughts on Vietnam as a whole, as a country, as an economy, and how it's moving forward in terms of digitalization and innovation. So it's really exciting to, to have that picture painted for us here on the show. And it's a really exciting time for Vietnam, for anyone else out there listening in who's interested in Vietnam. Thanks for tuning in and hopefully you pick something up. And if you're interested in learning more about Pinhe, you can reach out to Hui here. But yeah, once again, thanks for coming on, Hui. Thank you, thank you, Paolo, and thanks everyone for listening. If you like this episode, give our show a thumbs up or hit the like button on this video. Subscribe or follow us for next week's call. Be sure to dial in the next one.